All right, so I'd like to start just uh, with a show of hands. Um, can you raise your hand high if your mother tongue is not French? All right, that's quite a lot of people. That's, that's less than half, but, but a fair proportion. So what I'm going to present here is based on my experience of correcting people's uh, English when they write scientific articles. And most of it is French people's mistakes when they write scientific articles. So some of this is going to be, well, you can see it's in French, the text is in French, and some of it is going to be based on typical French-type mistakes when you're writing articles. But, I, I mean, different nationalities have different types of mistakes that they make, but there are some which are common. Okay, and most of what I'm going to say is pretty transferable to other languages as well. So hopefully it'll still be useful to you. Um, so I came up with a set of rules for things which I saw people doing which I think they shouldn't do or recommendations for things people should do. Um, and I put it in the form of a, what I call a decalogue, so the Ten Commandments. Right? Ten Commandments. Now, you should be, always be very, very suspicious when you see someone giving you a set of instructions or a set of rules, or even if they call them suggestions. You should be very suspicious because there's a lot of self-appointed experts in this field. There's a lot of bad advice out there. Right? And uh, if you see a, a set of rules like that, you should ask yourself, st to start with, do these rules make sense to me? Are they explained? Is there a reason behind these rules? Has somebody told you why that's a rule? Or have they just told you that's what you must do? Right? Secondly, look at the person giving the rules. Right? Is he a good writer? Is he a good presenter? This, works, this, this is equally true for presentation uh, advice. Is he good at what he's suggesting? Right? Um, is it based on experience? Or is it just based on something that your presenter has himself read and is propagating? Right? Because I've seen examples of very bad advice being given. And some of what I'm going to show you here is to try and redress that uh, problem. Okay, so. These Ten Commandments, you know, they're not uh, carved in stone, right? They are suggestions, right? So this, it's not like the Ten Commandments of Moses. It's more like you know, speed limits or traffic lights, okay? It's, it's just suggestions, right? <laughs> but, but if you're going to break these rules, you have, better have a pretty good reason, right? Um, so let's start. I'll still just go through them, and each one I will go into a little bit of detail. So uh, it starts with simple things to do with just getting your English grammar right, and it gradually progresses towards more style advice like Iron was giving just now. Um, so, tu fais pas des bêtises avec le nombre et la conjugation. So that's just simple, usually to do with whether or not you put S on the end of a word. French people get that wrong all the time, okay? Tu te trompes pas dans tes prépositions. It's again, what kind of preposition are you going to use? Sometimes it's complicated. Tu fais pas la traduction directe pour les articles. That's difficult. Uh, three genders in English, only two in French, etc. Tu te méfies pas des faux amis et des vrais ennemis. So this is a very, very long one. Um, there's a lot of words which are the same in French and in English, but they have quite different meanings. And it can be quite amusing, the consequences of that. But I have actually, so this document, the Decalogue, is on my website. My website is down here, okay? So you can go to that website and download a, a text which is written in French, and it just goes into some details on each of these rules. And at the end of that document, there's quite a long dictionary of, of faux amis, okay? So you can, you can have a look at that. Um, tu ne construis pas des énormes phrases comme adjectives. So sometimes... Before a noun, there'll be a great big piece of text which you think you can bundle together into an adjective. You can't do that. Tu ne mets pas les pronoms redondants partout. Well, I'll explain what that means when we get to it. Tu ne commences pas chaque phrase avec n'importe quoi. Ah, so you know that one. Yeah. 
so that's the result of some bad advice sometimes. All right, we'll get to that. Tu dis exactement ce que tu veux dire. So you shouldn't be afraid of just saying it. Okay, it's, it's kind of linked to the previous point. Tu n'as pas peur de te répéter. Don Irwin has already touched on that. Another result of sometimes bad advice. Right? Et tu t'exprimes avec les phrases courtes et les mots simples. Irwin has already talked about that as well. I'll go into a little more, a few more examples. So let's start with number one. Number one is pretty simple. So here are some examples. All right. What's wrong with these? Generally, when I put something in red, it's, there's something wrong with it. And then when I put it in blue, it should be all right. Okay? Don't, it weighs six kilograms and a half. What's wrong with that? So to start with, it weighs, conjugate, six kilograms, plural, and a half if you want, right? So this is the problem, right? You, it, it, conjugation in English is pretty simple, right? But you know, the third person gets an S, right? Whereas in French, it's the second person that gets the S. How confusing is that, right? So if you're lazy, then, then you don't worry too much about that, and you get it wrong all the time. Then plurals. Plurals in English have an S at the end. When you're speaking, you pronounce the S. Okay? The trouble with French is that when you're speaking French, usually the last few letters of the word <laughs> don't really matter anyway. Okay? So you tend to have this habit of not pronouncing the ends of words. And that is a serious problem. When you, when you speak English, the, the S at the end is important. Okay? So pronounce your English words all the way to the end, and don't forget to write them all the way to the end. Okay? Get your conjugation right, get your plurals right. So that's a simple sentence. This method allows us to estimate the weight. What's wrong with that? Allows us, that's right. The two harmonic functions project equally onto bases that are orthogonal. Now that's a little bit more subtle, OK? I've made some mistakes there. Projects, yeah, I've pluralized that. I shouldn't, because that's a verb, right? They project equally onto bases that are orthogonal. I've pluralized an adjective. Don't do that, OK? <laughs> In English, the adjectives don't agree with anything. They're just words, OK? You don't have to modify them. So make sure you don't do that. And the fire engines are red, all of them, all right? So that's simple stuff, all right? Amazing how often you get it wrong. So start by getting that right. And we'll move on, all right? Tu ne te trompes pas dans tes prépositions. OK, so in English, there are lots of prepositions. To, at, of, with, by. Which one do you use? All right. Well, actually, in French, there's a lot of prepositions as well. It's pretty much the same number of prepositions in French. It's just that you don't use them. You tend to just use a for everything, OK? So, it, but here's, here's the thing, right? In English, we have to and at. And they tend to get replaced by a systematically. So just remember this little rhyme that my mother used to say to me while she was cutting my fingernails, all right? This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed at home. This little piggy had roast beef. This little piggy had none. And this little piggy went like that. OK. So to, to market, at home. Right? He, stayed, he went to market. He stayed at home. To is for going somewhere, right? So we're going from A to B, from one place to another. At is a a position that uh, which you occupy. It's not movement, it's position. Okay? It's actually pretty reliable. So just think of that, and it works, right? in case you don't know which one to use. Um, there's a few examples. Well, it's difficult to explain, but you don't say starting by, beginning by. You say starting with, ending with. Um, during and pendant are not exactly equivalent, so be careful with that. Here's an example for that. La lune a caché le soleil pendant cinq minutes. Pendant l'eclipse, les oiseaux ont arrêté de chanter. So pendant, twice in those two sentences. But in English, you would say, the moon hid the sun for five minutes. And then during the eclipse, the bird stopped singing. So what's going on there? Well, if you're actually talking about a measure, a measurement, a quantity of time, like five minutes, you say four. If you're talking about an event, like an eclipse, that's when you say during, OK? So that's a fairly straightforward rule for not messing that up, OK? It's similar with since and depuis, 
Okay? Um, I have been waiting since Sunday, but I have been waiting for three days. You don't say I've been waiting since three days. Okay? Since, replies, uh, since applies to uh, a point in the past. And then if you're talking about a measurement of time, then it's not a point in the past. So you say for. All right? um, I am trying to do this since years. That's a, a quote from an ancient Prime Minister of Canada who was talking about, obviously talking about the referendum in Quebec. You know, can't speak English. Um, I, am, I am trying to do that. It should be, I have been trying to do this since years, four years, okay? Um, right, oh, déjà is a good one as well, right? So déjà does not necessarily mean already, okay? Um, so there's an example of that. It'd be like, uh, do you want to come for lunch? No, I've already eaten. Okay, that's good. Okay, um, because it means that it's something which has happened, which you weren't expecting to have happened, right? Or maybe it's happened a bit sooner than expected, right? Uh, um, if I want to say, have you already been to Paris? Asking about your travel experience. Have you already been to Paris? Or have you already been? to the Himalayas, whatever. Um, that would be a strange way to ask the question. I w what I should be saying is, have you ever been to the Himalayas? Have you ever been to Paris? Because I want to know about your experience. I don't want to know if I was expecting you to go to Paris a bit later, but have you done it sooner than I expected? You see? That's what have you already been to Paris means. So there's a subtle difference there. OK. And here's one which is. You know, this is actually carved in stone, this one. That's why I gave it big text, all right? Just don't do it, never. There is no circumstances where you would ever write associated to, all right? You say associated with. I don't mind if you don't agree with that or if you think it feels wrong or if you don't understand it. It doesn't matter what you think, okay? Just write associated with. Um, right. Tu ne fais pas la production directe pour les articles. Um, so, this is just a bit of idiom, really. Uh, there's no way to explain it. Je suis professeur. That's what I say in French. But in English, I am a professor. Okay? Uh, but on the other hand, you, when you're talking about a lab or a region, you say le Lagos, l'Afrique du West. In English, you wouldn't put the article. You'd just say Lagos. Uh, West Africa. So it's a bit difficult to know whether or not you put the article. It's a, very often a problem with French writers, very often, even more so with Russian writers. They have terrible trouble with that. Okay? Um, and frankly, my advice to you is if you think you should put the article, then don't. Right? And if you think you shouldn't put it, then, then put it. And then you probably improve your, your score. Um, but here's something logical. At least there's something logical you can do here, which distinguishes the English language a little bit is that you can have a specific singular, the fire engine is red, or a non-specific singular, a fire engine is red. In this case, you're talking about a particular fire engine. This one, you're talking about a fire engine, but you don't know which one. All right? You can pluralize that. The fire engines are red. Or if you don't know which fire engines you're talking about, you can say there are some fire engines. Some fire engines are red. If you miss off the article, though, something wonderful happens. Right? Fire engines are red. Now, there's no way to say that in French. You just need to put an article, right? But that is a rule. That's a general statement. That means that there aren't any fire engines that are yellow. They are all red. Okay? So it becomes quite powerful. So if you miss off an article under certain circumstances, you're actually doing something quite powerful. You're emitting a general rule. Right? So there's one logical thing which you can bear in mind. Right. OK. Tu te méfies des faux amis et des vrais ennemis. Right. So there's a very long list here. I don't have time to go through all of them. But as I said, there's a little dictionary in the back of my, my article that you can look at on my website. So here's some common ones. Right. Important, superior, in, well, important. Um, in French, it's just a synonym for big, 
Okay? It just expresses magnitude. In English, it, it means that it's got some significance or something that you should pay attention to. It's not talking about size. It's talking about, well, it's hard to say how important it is, right? Um, superior, again, in English, it's to do with quality and to do with status. It's not to do with size, right? So just remember that. Here's a funny one. Sensible, sensitive. So when you say sensible, what you mean is sensitive, okay? And this is true, this is true. Somebody I know quite well once said, I am sensible and you're a lunatic. And in French, that means je suis sage et tu es fou. Like, uh, what she meant to say was, I'm sensitive and you're a bit moody, right? Which is probably true, right? But um, what, she, what she actually said was that she's a reasonable person and I'm absolutely crazy. Uh, so, lunatic, sensible. Um, adapted. It's a, it's a word you like to use, adapted. Be careful, because it means something different in English. It means that something has had its function changed from one function to another. Okay, so you could say, ces bottes sont bien adaptées pour la marche à pied, which just means you've got some walking shoes, right? Um, these boots are well adapted for walking. What were they used for before? Ballet dancing, right? Uh, these boots are made for walking, right? That's the famous song. Um, so if you don't want, if you, instead of adapted, you should say suited or suitable. Consists in, it's actually correct, but um, you have to really know what you're doing. And most English speakers don't actually use that phrase anymore. Consists of is what people tend to say. All right. uh, here's a few more, because I have a long list. Um, I, well, I, this morning, quickly, I put a few in blue, so I remember I don't have time to talk about all of them. So um, what should we start? Eventually, that's a good one. In English, that just means after a long time. Whereas in French, it means maybe. Very different meaning, right? Um, words associated with probability are quite interesting because they're not interchangeable. Risk in French just means probability. It could be positive or negative. Je risque à passer chez toi. You know? Well, that might be positive, it might be negative. But, <laughs> um, but in English, it's always negative. A risk is something that you want to avoid. Right? Um, well, I mean, it might have negative consequences. Chance. Um, so in French, that's positive. In English, it's neutral. Okay. And then hasard, in French, that just means random. In English, it means threat. Okay. So in English, it's very negative. So be careful with that. Assist, je vais assister le, le séminaire de Irwin. I'm not going to help him, right? I'm just going to go to his seminar. So I'm not going to say assist. I'm just going to say I'm going to go there. Because assist in English means help, right? Um, pass. Oh, yeah, so I had a student a couple of weeks ago who said, I can't come because I'm going to pass my driving test. And I said, well, I hope you pass, you know. <laughs> but uh, pass in English means succeed. It doesn't just mean try. Okay. Um, Seance, that's a funny one in English. That, that's well, it's a French word, right? But we've, we've adopted it in English to mean trying to speak to your dead grandmother to ask her where she buried the money. Okay? That's all it means. Um, Souvenir, and that's a French word, it means memory, but in English it means a little thing that you buy in a gift shop, if you shake it, it makes snow on a, on a monument, right? Um, and this is my favorite, robot. Robot, in English it means um, some, a humanoid with artificial intelligence, which is built to serve you and help you in your daily life and will end up killing you, right? In French, it's just anything that works with electricity that you put in the kitchen. Right? <laughs> um, so, there's plenty more of those. Let's move on. Tu ne construis pas les énormes phrases comme adjectives. So, here we're starting to get towards the style advice. Right? So, en anglais, les adjectives viennent toujours avant les noms. So, in English, adjectives always come before the noun. The big red fire engine. So, you've got a fire engine, that's a noun. Big is an adjective. Red is an adjective. You've got to get the order right, but they always come before the noun. Uh, in French, it's le gros camion pompier rouge. Okay, so one before and one after. Okay, sometimes they come before, sometimes they come after. Um, so English is flexible, right? You can construct adjectives. You don't say, if you want to say la fête 
the fit to la science. You don't say the fair of the science. Okay, you can be more compact. You can say the science there. So we've taken the word science and used it as an adjective. Cool, right? You can avoid all these duh, uh, the duh, this, the duh, duh, that, duh, that, duh, that, duh, that. You don't have to do that in English. You can just lump them all in front of the noun, and you've got an adjective, and you know that, right? And you know that a little bit too well. You kind of abuse it, right? So, so, so here's a pretty compact thing. Les données du canal vapeur d'eau du météosat de la deuxième génération. You can say, you can say, and it makes sense, the meteosat second generation water vapor channel data, right? All that is an adjective and data is the noun. You can get away with that because it's very well understood. It's very well known in the community. But, you know, here's a few that I've invented. The camion rouge avec les cloches qui sont et un grand échelle. You don't say the red with ringing bells and a big ladder fire engine. It goes faster than the yellow fire engine. You've, you've, you've kind of broken the system if you do that. Um, you have to say the red fire engine, so I've already put the noun, right? With ringing bells and a big ladder, it goes faster than the yellow fire engine. You can't even say the two big apple. Maybe you should be able to say that. Maybe it'll come. Maybe English is always changing. But for the moment, it's, it's, it's a bit too far, right? Um, Okay, on a similar theme. Tu ne mets pas les pronoms redondants partout. So, Irwin already warned you about overusing pronouns. Uh, in French common speech, there's a tendency to use them a bit too much as well. Um, so, how do I say, um, where is John in French? Uh, would I say, où est Jean? Well, that would work, okay, that makes sense, but people don't tend to say that. They would say, il est où, comma, Jean, right? <laughs> il, il is the redundant pronoun. There's no need to use that pronoun, but you do it anyway, right? Ils sont, où sont mes clés? You don't say that. Où sont elles mes clés, father? Where are they, comma, my keys? Il commence à quelle heure, le match? It starts at what time? The match, right? <laughs> Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire? Redondant. What does it mean? Redondant. So, where are my keys? What time does the match start? What does redundant mean? Okay. So, and it's not just in questions. It can say, you can also put it into phrases. It depends what it means. Redundant. This depends what redundant means. So here's a fabricated artificial example. The results from our experiment are highly sensitive to how regularly spaced they are and whether they are far apart or close together, the rainfall measuring stations. So, so I actually, I invented that, all right? I've seen things which are, well, perhaps not as bad as that, but, but uh, what would you say? You would say the results from our experiments are highly sensitive. To, so, so experiment is already there, right? For our experiment is how highly sensitive to how regularly spaced the rainfall measuring stations are, comma, and whether they are far apart or close together. No pronoun in there, right? Um, Moving up, tu commences par chaque phrase avec n'importe quoi. So you know this very well, right? Um, en ce qui concerne le camion pompier, il est rouge. Ceci étant, il a une cloche. <laughs> Toutefois, <laughs> il a une échelle. <laughs> right. So all these words like en ce qui concerne, par contre, toutefois, en revanche, sinon, d'ailleurs, ceci étant, cela dit, cependant, par conséquent, en effet, de fait, autrement dit, pourtant, en plus, all these little phrases, right, they actually do mean something. Every single one of them has a very specific meaning, but the way you use them, it doesn't really matter what they mean, because you've just got this feeling that you can't just say something. You've got to put something at the beginning of the sentence to kind of get the reader ready to finish reading the sentence, okay? Uh, and... This is not entirely your fault. This comes from bad advice. I mean, and not just French. Also, I, I had a Vietnamese student uh, who, who told me that her English teacher had told her that she had to do that, right? So all these experts giving you bad advice, be careful, right? Um, so if you want to say concerning the fire engine, it is red. On the other hand, it has a bell. Moreover, it has a ladder. Well, just think for a second, because you can say this. Uh, what I say in my text is, take my hand, you know, hold my hand and come with me. And just say, the fire engine is red, it has a bell and a ladder. All you need to say, right? And it's amazing how often that comes back. Um, 
So, tu dis exactement ce que tu, tu, ce que tu veux dire. So, we're coming more towards style advice, really, now. Uh, and um, uh, some of this advice is general. It's not specific to English, right? But, um, for example, here's an example of a logical structure where your sentence is going to end up being too long. On the one hand, x, but on the other hand, y. Um, sorry, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, scrub that. <laughs> Let's start again. Tu dis exactement ce que tu veux dire. So here's, here's a, a logical opposition, right? You say, on the one hand, x, but on the other hand, y, right? Now, if you're going to use this slightly laborious expression on the one hand, on the other hand, you, you really have to make sure that it means something, that, that there is genuinely an opposition between x and y. If you're just saying it to fill space, then you're guilty of doing what I've just been criticizing, okay? Um, all these logical words, but, however, if, and, there's no margin for error in English. You can't just throw them in there for effect. If it sounds good, it's not necessarily the right word just because it sounds good. It has to, you have to want to express the exact meaning that the word encompasses. And so you should think of English like a computer language, right? If you use the wrong logical operator in a computer code, your program will not do what you want it to do. It's the same when you're writing English, okay? So, so here, I th and I think that when you're writing English, this kind of thing is stricter than if you're writing French. Um, and so here's, and here's a slightly more subtle example, because it does, the context in which you're writing does change things a bit. You can say in a, in a novel, for example, if he was afraid, he did not show it, right? Um, so that's fine. It means he was afraid and he didn't show it because he's brave, all right? He's the hero. In a travel guide, if the pyramids are impressive, the Nile is truly magnificent. That's fine, okay? It doesn't actually logically mean what it says. It doesn't mean that if the pyramids weren't impressive, the Nile would not be magnificent, okay? But if you try and do that in a scientific article, then you will come a cropper, okay? If the results are not entirely convincing, they do provide some clues. Don't do that, right? Because that means that if they were entirely convincing, they knew, then they would not provide some clues, okay? Just think about the logic of what you're saying. And this is my favorite. This is uniquely French, as far as I know. C'est pas parce que le camion est rouge qu'il va vite. When you say that, what are you saying? C'est pas parce que le camion est rouge qu'il va vite. Um, that means that the, what you're saying, what you're trying to say is that the camion is slow, right? Il est lent. Il est rouge, mais quand même il est lent. Et tu suppose que... S'il est rouge, ça veut, ça veut dire qu'il va vite. Non, non, il est lent. Right? The camion is slow. Logically, it means the exact opposite of that, right? It means that the camion, what it really means is that it's fast, but it's for some other reason than its color. It's got a big engine or something, right? You see? And the, every day, you get the logic of what you're saying completely opposite to what you really mean, and you don't even realize it. So... Be careful with that. It's not because the fire engine is red that it goes fast. It's not what you want to say. What you want to say is, just because the fire engine is red, that doesn't mean it goes fast. Um, okay. Number nine, nearly there. Tu n'as pas peur de te répéter. So this is something which uh, you learned at school, unfortunately. All right. Your teachers probably told you that you shouldn't repeat the same word in a sentence. Did they, is that right? Did they tell you that? Right, I've got to make sure I don't say any bad words because we're being filmed here. Nonsense, okay? It's absolute nonsense. There is no reason whatsoever to believe that. If you repeat words in a sentence, it can actually be really beautiful. Um, and it's not just allowed. It's compulsory to do that, all right? So I'm just going to read this to you in French, OK? Si c'est le bon mot, il faut absolument utiliser. Et pas un autre mot moins bon. Il arrive assez souvent que tu as besoin de ce bon mot deux fois 
terms in France. The repetition du mot est non seulement permise, elle est obligatoire. Toute variation subtile faite pour éviter la répétition laisse le lecteur à la recherche des racines de cette variation. Il s'agit d'une distraction pour le lecteur qui est souvent obligé de relire la même phrase plusieurs fois pour tirer son vrai sens. Um, so, if you have the right word and you need it twice in a sentence, don't substitute it the second time for some other word which is not quite what you mean. Just avoid repetition because what's that going to happen is that the reader is going to look at that sentence and he's going to say, what? what's going on? What's the difference between that and this? And in fact, the answer is nothing. It's just that you were afraid to repeat a word. So you've totally misled the reader. It's reader abuse. Okay? Don't do it. Here's an example. The total summer rainfall in the northern site is equal to the integrated winter precipita precipitation in the southern observing station. What on earth is that all about? What's the difference between rainfall and precipitation? What's the difference between total and integrated? What's the difference between a site and an observing station? Nothing. What you want to say is that the total summer rainfall in the northern site is equal to the total winter rainfall in the southern site. Isn't that much more beautiful? There's a symmetry. There's a meaning. It's easy to understand. Right? When something is clear and easy, it's beautiful. Right? Um, so, last rule, and this really touches on something that Iron was saying as well. Les cerveaux des Français sont plus grands que celles des Anglais. That's true. French people have bigger brains than English people. And it's because you need them to stock lots of kind of live memory because you've got to get through to the end of this enormous sentence. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, remember what it's about right up to the end. Uh, sometimes you don't know what the sentence is about until almost the last word. So you've really got to be able to... So, so, so yeah, this is where I was getting confused earlier. If you have a structure like whereas phrase one, comma, phrase two, so you've got two things sort of in opposition, phrase one and phrase two, and you're throwing it all into one sentence. Um, but what happens is when you read whereas, there's a little flag that goes up in your brain. It says, okay, I'm looking for a comma here. Got to get to the end of phrase one. There's my comma. Right, now the rest of this has got to be in opposition to, to what I read before. So you've got a lot of buffer space being occupied while you're doing that, while you're passing that. Right? Make it easier. For an English person to read, we need you to do this. Right? Phrase one, just a statement. Okay? Full stop. You've made a statement. You want to put something in opposition to that? You can write it in the, in the next <laughs> sentence. Right? However, phrase two. Okay, so now I haven't had the little flag up. I'm not using all that buffer space. I'm just reading linearly and understanding as I go. Right? Uh, and what permits you to do that in English, where you're less comfortable doing that in French, is because we have this um, practice in English that exactly as Iron was saying earlier, the sentences can work together as a team. Right? You don't need to have every sentence to be completely self-contained. You can trust your reader when he reads the second sentence not to have completely forgotten what he read in the previous sentence. Okay? So, um, en anglais, chaque phrase n'est pas censée être autonome. Les phrases travaillent ensemble. L'information passe de l'une à l'autre. And as Iran was saying, this repetition can help you to make the link for in successive sentences as well. It's a very useful um, technique. Um, Okay, now just a general comment to finish. Um, the more time you spend writing something, the more care you put into writing something, the less time it takes to read. Okay? So put yourself in the position of the reader. Right? You, when, when you're a writer, you're also a reader. And, you know, it's a continuous process of improving and learning. Right? So I'm glad to see there's not just students here. We've got some senior people uh, hiding at the back there. Everyone's constantly learning and improving. Me too. I mean, I, I'm improving. And I'm not improving monotonically either. Sometimes I write a paper and I'm not quite so happy with it. And then the next one is way better. Um, always refining, always learning. And the key to good writing is to think about your reader. right? And um, put yourself in there position. Often I write a paper and I put it aside for a week 
And when I come back to it and I read it, I'm no longer the writer, I'm the reader. And it's quite an interesting experience because I think, what was I trying to say there? You know, it, that's not good, that's not clear, and I change things. Right? Okay, so I'm just going to finish with a few outside the 10 rules. There's a few uh, specific comments to make. Um, so, citation style, um, this is just something that bugs me. Okay, so there's the lazy list style, which I see more and more. The annual cycle of observed rainfall is highly sensitive to location in convective regime. Open brackets, and away you go. All the papers that you haven't bothered to read, close brackets, right? That's common, but it's lazy, right? Informative storytelling style for citations is much better and more rewarding for the reader. In an observational study, Jones et al. showed that the annual cycle rainfall is sensitive location. Smith et al., 2001, 2007, sorry, link this sensitivity to new activity. So, so you're getting information as you cite, and that's the whole point of citing. It's not just to say, look what I've read. You're writing something which is supposed to be informative and attributing your knowledge as you go. All right? So that's one thing that bothers me. Here's the other thing that bugs the hell out of me. All right? This really annoys me. Um, to bake a cake pie, put it in the oven, grill, at 400, 200 degrees Fahrenheit Celsius for 30, 20 minutes, seconds. <laughs> all right. Every time I'm happily reading a paper and I run up again in something like that, all my cognitive processes grind to a halt. Um, how, long, how many times do you have to read that to understand what the hell it's about? Why would you do that? Right? Um, so here, I can rewrite it. Look, to bake a cake, put it in the oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. To bake a pie, put it in the grill for 200 degrees Celsius for 20 seconds. Now, this is not supposed to be culinary advice, OK? I just thought it just made that up randomly. But you see, it's hardly any longer. So if you're doing that to save space, then there are better ways of saving space, right? Like removing the first half of all your sentences to start with, right? Um, here's a more realistic example. The northern, southern, sea surface temperature normally is cold, warm. It's amazing how often you see that. It's, right? What you could do is repeat it. The northern sea surface temperature normally is cold. The southern sea surface temperature normally is warm. Well, that's a bit laborious, right? But look, it's not that much longer. Um, you could rephrase it. The sea surface temperature normally are cold in the north and warm in the south. And you see, it's the same length. If you're doing that to save space, if your supervisor thinks that that's a good idea, then your supervisor is an idiot. Okay. <laughs> There's another alternative. Um, the northern sea surface temperature normally is cold. The southern one is warm. Well, that's, it's understandable, OK? But it does break the forbidden pronoun rule. So be careful. Um, anyway, there's absolutely no reason to do that. It's a form of reader abuse. It's a crime against the reader to do that. And it also it can get even worse, because I'm using parentheses as alternatives here. What happens? if you want to actually use parentheses for what they're really supposed to be for, which is for little clarifications, which are not part of the main sentence. Every now and then, we want to do that. And someone's going to read that and think it's an alternative. Right? So it's a very dangerous and stupid thing to do. Don't do it. All right, that's, I think I'm finished there. Yeah. Is anybody courageous enough to ask a question to Nick? <laughs> Hi, I'm Andres from IRAP, a PhD student. Um, I was wondering, sometimes I don't know why I feel there's a difference between using the blah, 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 of blah, 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 instead of putting the adjective before the noun. Mm -hmm. Is it exactly the same, or sometimes maybe more beautiful, or I don't know? Well, uh, it's very difficult to give a general answer to a question like that. It does mean the same thing. Um, it's just a question of, of how compact and clear it is. And compact and clear are not always the same thing, right? So sometimes it's better to just use that long um, um, expression with a, with a preposition in it. Um, 
don't be afraid of doing that, right? Um, but it's very, I can't give you a general rule. Yeah. But then you wouldn't say always use the adjective before the noun? No, okay. definitely not, no. Okay. no there, there, isn't, there isn't a general principle for that. You have to read it and put yourself in the position of the reader and see, is it, I mean, if you put it before the noun, if you use it as an adjective, is it ungainly? Is it confusing? Is it too long? If so, then use the preposition, put it afterwards. If you put, if you have, if you use this with the preposition, um, ask yourself, does that sound foreign? Does it sound um, long-winded and laborious? Would it be more compact to use it as an adjective? You see, it, it really is a subjective call. You have to make the decision yourself. Oops. Okay. No more questions? What do you think about the use of a comma followed by and in a sentence? Oh, that's a good question, yeah. It doesn't bother me at all. I, I do it myself. Um, uh, if you think that you need to take a breath before you read the and part of the sentence, then just put the comma. Uh, if people who say thou shalt not do that, that's just like style handbook fascism. Right? That's my opinion. Right? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a researcher at IRAP. A question about the use of IE and EG and punctuation. Yeah. What's the question? <laughs> when to use one and the other? What are the common mistakes that we make? Well, think of it like um, EG means for example, right? So you are putting a, something which illustrates the point you've just made. Whereas IE is a bit like an equal sign in, in maths, right? This means uh, this is one way of saying it. What I mean by that is this, another way of saying the same thing. Right? So are you rephrasing something to clarify it, or are you giving an example of what you've said? Are you using a comma or a full product? Oh, uh, it's up okay. to you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> matter what you do, the, the, the technical editor will screw it up anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned uh, these... Um, Parentheses to add clarifications. Yeah. I find sometimes they are a bit uh, annoying when you use them too much. I don't know. Do you have any opinion? On oh, I totally agree with you. I have a co-author who does it far too much, and I and I remove them all and put them in separate sentences. You can overdo it, but it's it's a useful thing to use occasionally. Yeah. 